Change is good. Doctor Who has shown that time and time again, and the series has a funny habit of resetting itself every decade or so. In 1980, a new production team took over, promising to reform a series that by the end of the 70s seemed to have more off days than good days. Like a box of chocolate assortments, that's 90% those awful coffee custard toffee banoffee ones. Time to look at Doctor Who's 18th season. Haven't I seen you somewhere before? <laughs> The previous season of Doctor Who, the 17th, was a story of ups and downs, the highest ever ratings achieved by the series, and it gave us a bona fide classic in City of Death, but then there were also the lows of having a story cancelled halfway through production due to a strike. Producer Graham Williams and script editor Douglas Adams, yes that one, both got into their escape capsules and headed for the safety of anywhere but here. The BBC offered the producer role to John Nathan Turner, which was unusual in that he was neither a writer nor a director, nor had he ever been a producer. But Nathan Turner had been working on the show for the previous three seasons as the production unit manager, a multifaceted role where he had managed to juggle the budgets just enough for the show to manage a short foreign location shoot for City of Death. Now clutching the keys to the production office and full of ambition, John Nathan Nathan Turner had thought, hmm, yes, it's gotten very silly. As Nathan Turner, often referred to as JNT, was a new producer, the BBC brought in former producer Barry Letts as an executive producer to guide the rookie showrunner. Like JNT, Barry Letts had thought, yes, it's gotten very silly. They brought in a new script editor, Christopher Bidmead, and together the three of them agreed, yes, it's gotten very silly. The one person who wasn't saying, yes, it's gotten very silly, was Tom Baker, who would be playing the Doctor for an unprecedented seventh season. And there were large numbers of the show's younger viewership for whom he was the only Doctor Who that they knew of. The new team made wholesale changes. Nathan Turner wanted a tight grip on the show, and so no directors who had previously worked on the series were asked back possibly because they had generally not done enough to rein in Tom Baker's worst excesses. And with very few exceptions, writers who had previously scripted episodes were generally not likely to get a callback. Change started from the very first frame of the season. The title sequence would be updated, with the Doctor's face forming from the stars. And there was a new logo, inspired by neon signage. The show's most prolific composer, Dudley Simpson, had by 1980 pretty much scored the show's incidental music for years. But as part of the new broom, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop would now create all of the show's incidental music, as well as the custom sound effects, and they would also take a crack at updating the theme music. For 17 seasons, the same recordings of the Doctor Who theme made in 1963 were used and edited again and again. Composer Rodden Greener had written a standard tune, but it was Delia Derbyshire and the BBC Radiophonic Workshop who brought it to life. Individual tones were recorded and spliced together on tape reels and mixed together. It sounded unlike anything else, which is why it lasted as long as it had. But 17 years is 17 years, and when your theme tune is almost old enough to vote, a bit of an update is probably not a bad idea. Workshop composer Peter Howell volunteered for the task, mindful of an abortive attempt to update the theme in the early 70s. This is the theme as it was released on vinyl by the BBC. Here's the theme as it appeared on television. And here's how it sounds on my car with busted speakers. It's got a driving beat without any percussion and became an iconic part of the series for fans in the early 80s. I even remember going to a town show as a kid and this version was played over the PA system during the nightly fireworks display, along with music from Star Wars and E.T. While Nathan Turner took Dudley Simpson to lunch to give him the bad news, he couldn't yet do the same to K-9, since A. K-9 was a prop, B. didn't eat anyway, and C. was armed and dangerous with a body count only eclipsed by that other killer robot, Tweaky. Nathan Turner, Bidmead and Letts all disliked K-9 conceptually, and his presence on the TARDIS did make them all agree, yes, it's gotten very silly. <laughs> K-9 was a dramatic get-out-of-jail-free car, and the trio wanted him written out of the series as soon as possible. But by now, the BBC had sunk in so much money into improvements for the radio-controlled K-9 prop that he had to be kept around at least for the time being. K-9! K-9! 
Nathan Turner did manage to convince K9's original voice actor John Leeson to return for what would be the Tin Dog's final season as a regular, one that saw him incapacitated in some way for most stories. Full fat K9 blasting people was not going to be the solution to anything. K9, who, when he wasn't mowing down various guards, was a mobile computer who had whatever info the doctor needed. Having K9 around is a bit like the debate people have now about who starred in such and such a movie. It always ends with someone pulling out their phone to Google the answer. K9's days on the series were numbered. I mean, there wasn't a literal countdown, but you get the picture. Lala Ward returned as Romana, but she too would be leaving. Nathan Turner felt the combination of The Doctor, Romana and K9 was a show full of know-alls who were too clever by half. It does seem a weird way to smarten up the show by dumbing it down, but whatevs. I knew it. The Doctor's costume would have a radical update with a burgundy colour scheme, new scarf, great coat and controversially question marks added to his lapels. All I have on my lapels are bits of congealed cheese from yesterday's pizza. Depending on who you asked or when you asked, Tom Baker either loved the new costume or hated it, though I suspect the latter. Tom Baker had had a difficult relationship with the show's previous producer, but John Nathanton knew what he'd be dealing with and wouldn't budge in disagreements with the show's established star. There were disagreements between the star and producer over things like the show's direction, the star having to wear stage makeup in the studio, or even who had the best head of curly hair. Nathan Turner would prevail in most cases, and for Baker, the writing was on the wall. The Leisure Hive opened the season, and it was certainly different. Even with the new music credits, costumes, etc., the show looked and felt completely different than the previous season. This is your scarf, isn't it, Doctor? Writer David Fisher, who'd already written for the previous two seasons, had to contend with his story heavily rewritten to fit in with the show's new direction. The Leisure Hive sees the Doctor and Romana visiting the planet Argolis, scene of a nuclear war decades previously. The Argolan are slowly dying off and their education and resort business is also not tracking well. Their former enemies, the reptilian Famasi, have made an offer to buy the planet you know, motivated sellers and all that. In all of this, there's some trickery around regenerating the Argolan thanks to their fancy tachyon technology. And there's also the warmongering Pangol, who seems strangely youthful. An accident sees the Doctor instantly age 500 years, like the parents of a newborn. And a Famasi plot coming undone nearly ends with another war. The Leisure Hive has something that you couldn't often apply to Doctor Who, especially in the late 70s. It looks slick. The director, Lovett Bickford, treated the production like a film, often lining up shots like a single camera drama, rather than something recorded in a multi-camera video studio. While this took up a lot of time, it does give the show a much more modern appearance that viewers had a right to expect after years of seeing this, and this, and this. The new radiophonic music works really well, and the show was now able to use the latest in video effects. Sure, it looks a bit blocky now, like Minecraft pornography, but it was as cutting edge as you could get on a BBC budget. Quantel could manipulate the picture, zoom into an image, give you access to freeze frames, all things you couldn't easily do in a videotape studio a few years earlier. Leisure Hive does sometimes get a bit impenetrable, like a diamond encrusted calzone, and that's possibly down to the direction, though it only occasionally feels like style over substance. I'm sick of being old. The reveal of the human financier Brock turning out to be a Famasi gangster is handled a bit cack-handedly, like that time there was no bog roll in the gents down at the pub. Overall, the Leisure Hive is a really effective, soft reboot of the series. It's a promising start. The science in the story was also more plausible, or at least less overtly plucked out of a duck's backside than before. Perhaps because guest actor Nigel Lambert was later the narrator on Look Around You. And remember, look around you. Megloss is almost a throwback. It seems like a show that, with a few more gags and piss farting around from Tom Baker, could have easily been a show from the previous year. It's one of the lesser stories of the season, but it still comes off better than most of the shows from the season before. Some Gaztec pirates have brought a kidnapped human to the dead world of Zolfothura, where they find their client is a cactus called Megloss. <laughs> I am the plant. 
I thought to myself, ooh ah, that's a bit funny. Meglos has designs on a thing called the Dodecahedron, which is now powering the neighboring world of Tigella, and Meglos wants it for himself. The Dodecahedron, which has 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 sides, is capable of powering entire worlds, or destroying them, or able to manufacture about $5 worth of Bitcoin in a calendar year. Meglos traps the Doctor in a time loop, while he impersonates the Time Lord in order to steal the Dodecahedron, perhaps because he was just really desperate for a 12-sided die for his Barbarian's Mega Axe in Dungeons & Dragons. Well, precisely because I'm not the Doctor. Then who are you? I am Meglos! Last Zolfa Thorin. Meglos is a little sillier than you'd expect for the season. And the production, at a few moments, is just that little bit sloppier than normally would have been accepted for this run of stories. Tom Baker plays the Doctor, as well as the somewhat less flippant Meglos doppelganger, and of course, spiky Meglos, looking like a cucumber mated with a hedgehog, a scenario where everyone loses. Baker does a great job of keeping the various versions different enough. I can't imagine the spiky makeup would have put the notoriously prickly star in a good mood, particularly when they absolutely insisted on putting the spikes where you couldn't see them. Meglos also features Jacqueline Hill as Lexa, a religious leader who spends most of the story as an antagonist. Hill, of course, had played one of the Doctor's original companions, Barbara Wright, back at the very start of the series. Bill Fraser as General Grugger apparently wanted to do the show, but only if he could kick the tin dog. You're useless! Meglos is fun enough, if not brilliant enough to stand out, and it's probably let down by a fairly standard direction. Yeah, the silly wigs don't help all that much either. Meglos is notable for using an experimental technology that linked studio cameras mechanically so that a camera shooting actors could match the moves of a camera shooting a model background in real time. Think of it as a early 80s beer and crisps version of motion control and virtual sets and you have the general idea. Back in the 16th season, the entire season formed a larger story arc detailing, yep, the search for the key to time. For this season, the show would experiment with a plot arc playing out over three distinct stories. This has become known as the E-Space Trilogy, or if you're French, the Renault Espace. Full Circle was most likely the first time an actual fan of the show was able to write for the series. Andrew Smith was still a teenager when he had his script for the series produced, a show that would also introduce a new companion, Adric, played by Matthew Waterhouse. There is no need to be alarmed. Also someone who'd identified as a fan. We'll talk more about Adric in a moment. Having been recalled to Gallifrey, Romana is deeply unhappy with the prospect of returning home, possibly because she has all of those unpaid parking tickets. En route, the TARDIS is accidentally transported through a vent into another universe, later identified as eSpace. You mean to tell me that after all we've been through, the systems are functioning perfectly? No, not perfectly, Master. Adverb attributed was normally the planet Alzarius is about to go through a climate cycle known as Mistfall, where the air is unbreathable for several years, like Los Angeles, but at least on Alzarius it's only temporary. The Alzarians retreat to their crashed Starliner, which they maintain and repair as the Alzarians make preparations to leave Alzarius and return to their own planet. Eventually. There are some outlaws, including Adric's older brother, who seems overly burdened with more charisma and acting ability. Romana gets infected by some spiders who come out of the local produce, and yeah, I think I'm done with watermelon for good. The Alzarians are led by the Three Deciders, wise elders who are supposedly responsible for the well-being of the community, but whose mission seems to be perpetual procrastination which sounds like the name of a death metal band I might form one day, you know, sometime in the future. Uh, once I get past this hump at work and finish building the fence, and once I've bought all the equipment I need. Thanks to the manuals that have been passed down, we could take the Starliner apart and put it together again perfectly. Though there is one thing we can't do, Doctor. Nobody knows how to pilot this ship. What a twist. Full Circle is a story that holds up pretty decently and the production does the job nicely. It's not perfect by any means, but it's really quite solid. The Alzerians are different in that they were very 80s looking without being too 80s looking. The Marshmen do look a little like the creature from the Black Lagoon, but that's leaps and bounds better than the Mirror Universe Wombles from last season. Oh, and the story has Inspector Wexford. It's also the first time in a very long time that we've actually seen something approaching crew quarters in the TARDIS. You can't fight Time Lords, Romana. You did. 
once. Mm. I'm lost. Ramana's room is decorated with souvenirs from her travels with the doctor, and her sulking in her room is probably the most angst a companion has displayed in a very long time. Adric is last seen in the TARDIS, unbeknownst to the Doctor and Romana, but we'll learn in the next story that he stowed away. Adric was the first new companion of the 1980s, and was one of the most derided for a very long time. Adric is meant to be smart, with his badge for mathematical excellence. Well, of course I'm better than you. I'm an elite. And that's where his character description ended. He was originally meant to be a bit of a scamp, but casting and a lack of interest by writers meant we really didn't get much of anything from the character. At least some of the time, Adric was willing to learn from the Doctor, much in the same way the Doctor had previously mentored Leela or Joe Grant. Adric's mathematical brilliance would crop up from time to time, but he worked best as a character alongside Tom Baker. The instructions have to be punched in by machine code. Oh, how boring. Boring? Bo in theory, we should be able to do things like this. Yeah. Matthew Waterhouse was a relatively inexperienced actor with some TV under his belt, but there are almost two Adricks in the show. The character in this season, who's willing to work with the Doctor, and the imbecilic buffoon of the following year, but more on that later. Waterhouse and Baker seem a good team, even though he's often playing third or even fourth fiddle to other companions and guest stars. Mind you, they did say I had a very sophisticated prose style. As for your handwriting... Handwriting? What about my handwriting? It's marvellous. If you need anything, there are guards outside the door. Many guards. State of Decay was generally derided by fans for many years, mainly because of its less than amazing effect shots. But when you look at it now, it's actually quite good for the most part. The Doctor and Romana find themselves on a backward planet where nothing has changed for a very long time. No, not Norfolk. I've never seen such a state of decay. Be careful, Doctor. We have acquired great powers. A spaceship landed here long ago and apparently descendants of the flight crew have become the three who rule. There's a giant vampire waiting to return and there are legends of Time Lords fighting a race of vampires and hunting them down with bowships. Swift vessels that fired a mighty bolt of steel that transfixed the monsters through the heart. Which sounds really cool as long as you don't end up with the one where the manufacturer got the wrong idea. It's a gothic horror, heavily inspired by Hammer Films, from a time when the series wasn't doing that sort of thing at all. Of course, there's a reason why it seems a bit out of place. As the season was being prepared, the script cupboard was pretty bare, and a script that Terence Dix had originally been commissioned to write to introduce the 15th season had been resurrected, rewritten, and put into production as State of Decay. It's the fourth story of the season, but was second in production, which may explain why Matthew Waterhouse's performance is far, far worse than his introductory story. Adric here looks and moves like Hervé Villachet from Fantasy Island, but scaled up slightly in Photoshop. His acting, let's be nice and say, hints at a level of inexperience that perhaps wasn't considered as much as it should have been during the casting of a regular character. Unless you aid us, we shall all be killed. Then die. That is the purpose of God. The worst effect of the season, other than Adric, in a season where, Adric aside, the effects work had generally improved leaps and bounds over previous years, is either when the scout ship is launched and programmed to come down and kill the giant vampire, or the giant vampire itself, which is either a doll or a glove. Yeesh. It sometimes only takes one shot like this to undo a whole story. The three who rule are suitably creepy for the most part, building up to performances that are a little large. But then, when you go up against Waterhouse in a scene, you better bring your A-game. Because, you know, someone should. Though, I'm still getting a bit of a What We Do In The Shadows vibe. State of Decay is a chance for Doctor Who to give dialogue to longtime stunt performer Stuart Fell, a man with the fourth best name for a stuntman after Bob Burns, Jason Crash, and Andy Turtz. Warrior's Gate is a weird story to close out the eSpace trilogy. Steve Gallagher's story is ambitious in terms of hoping the audience will understand what's going on. Tharrells, formerly less than benevolent rulers, are now enslaved due to their time-sensitive abilities and as such prized by the slavers since they can somehow navigate timelines. The Doctor and Romana find themselves stuck in a void that may be the way out of eSpace. The slavers led by Rorvik are a mismatched lot. Technical term, idiots. 
Rovik is played by Clifford Rose, at the time best known as playing the icy Nazi Kessler in Secret Army. This is the end for all of you. I'm finally getting something done. <laughs> and there's also Kenneth Cope from Randall and Hopkirk Deceased. Microcosm, universe, system, unbalanced and contracting. <laughs> Even though the Tharolds were a new race, they always reminded me of something. And I don't know if this means anything to people outside of, say, Australia, the Paddle Pop Lion. I think he's known as Max in some countries. Warrior's Gate is one of those stories where the director wanted to prove himself. A little ambition from a Who director goes a long way. Too much ambition, and you end up with behind the scenes problems such as those encountered on Warrior's Gate. It's like Evil Knievel trying to jump 27 buses while riding a Vespa with only a thimble full of fuel. Momentum only gets you so far. In this case, the number 25 to Newmarket. It's a polarizing story. You either love it for its style and ambition, or you hate it because it's obtuse and confusing. People walking through mirrors, people chroma keyed on black and white photographs, people walking around an off-white void. The story can be rewarding or maddening, like getting the Incredible Hulk to change a watch battery. Hulk fix. No thanks, Hulk, it's still under warranty. No more orders, Doctor. Goodbye. What? I want a moment to choose! It's got to be my own Romana. Romana and K9 both exit the series here. You were the noblest Romana of them all! Unlike the last few times a regular has left the show, Romana makes some very vague references to Adric about not being with the Doctor forever. And of course, You know I don't want to get back to Gallifrey! Which is her fate if they ever return to normal space. Where she also has to deal with those outstanding arrest warrants over the shoplifting offences. K9 is damaged by the time winds and can only be restored by staying behind. If you've just had a chill run down your spine at the possibility of Adric being the only companion, don't worry just yet. Will you listen to me when I'm talking? This is very serious. The Keeper of Traken sees the Doctor and Adric asked by the Keeper of... Ah, uh, Keeper of... It's on the tip of my tongue. I'm sure it'll come back to me later. Anyway, Traken's a pretty chill place. Like Sweden in the summer, but without the huge death toll. Evil just shrivels up and dies, which is quite an achievement. And so when a malevolent statue, the Melka, lands on Traken, it just becomes a fancy garden ornament. Really, it's just biding its time while it tightens its hold over Consul Cassia. Her husband, Tremus, has been selected to become the next Keeper of... Keeper of... Anyway, but the Melka has other plans. You still do not recognize me, Doctor, but soon you will know me. Keeper of Traken is a studio-bound show where the designers put in the hard work to make lush, ornate sets which is at odds with the traditional plain and austere sets the show had often been stuck with in any extraterrestrial setting. The show is what they call a cracking story, one that is generally well made and well acted. Tremus's daughter Nyssa was originally created just for this one story, but producer John Nathan Turner decided the character would make a great companion, just not yet. The story delivers a bit of a twist when it's revealed that the Melka is in fact a TARDIS. And who's TARDIS? Of course, the master. When we last saw him in the 1976 story, The Deadly Assassin, he was not looking well. And here he's still at the end of his final regeneration, back when such a thing was still a thing. The final twist, of course, is that the Master uses his powers, gained from being the Keeper of... Keeper of... Anyway, that place, to take over the body of Tremus. A new body at last. Anthony Ainley played Tremus as a sympathetic scientist and leader, but now he would go on to play the master throughout the 80s as a moustache twirling villain. <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> the CV. <laughs> it's all mine. <laughs> Complete with a fetish for over the top plots, requiring, but not really requiring, elaborate disguises, which would often involve Ainley being credited on screen and in the TV listings, with a series of anagrams to try and preserve the surprise. I knew it. How do you deduce that? I just guessed. Never guess. Unless you have to. There's enough uncertainty in the universe as it is. Tom Baker had decided fairly early on in the season, perhaps with some encouragement from producers, that this would be his final year in the role. It was also around this time that the idea of a female doctor was first mooted. His final story would have a feeling of inevitability about it. Like when you're watching one of those old British action shows from the 60s and the villains are driving a white Jaguar, you know exactly what's going to happen to them in the end. The Doctor has decided he wants to get the TARDIS fixed, since the shape-changing chameleon circuit needs a service after getting stuck in the shape of a police box. It's probably a good thing that the TARDIS didn't land in a sewer when the chameleon circuit became stuck, otherwise decades of Doctor Who merchandise would conjure up a very different smell. 
Logopolis is a place where men sit on stools and jibber-jabber mathematical equations to create, well, pretty much anything you want. You want a solid gold dishwasher? Sure. Hovering trees? Fine. A Tesla toilet called the Cybertoit? All yours. There's a mysterious white figure it glimpsed throughout the show, merely referred to as the Doctor's Friend or the Watcher. Clearly someone who's vitamin D deficient, and we never hear him speak. The Doctor's plan involves materialising around an actual police box to measure, but instead finds it's already got a TARDIS sitting there. What were the odds of that? I just bet that master bloke is involved. I've just dipped into the future. We must be prepared for the worst. Just when you thought the series was just going to be the Doctor travelling with Adric, Logopolis brings back Nyssa as a companion. Aristocratic and scientifically proficient, Nyssa is a character that follows the path of so many 80s companions of having next to no character development outside of their first and last stories. Though one of the few exceptions to this was Tegan Jovanka, an Australian air stewardess on her way to Heathrow to crew her first flight when her aunt Vanessa's car develops a flat tyre on the road. Being Australian, Tegan has been described as a mouth on legs. And what a mouth. <laughs> Auntie Vanessa. Her aunt isn't much better. Tell her f Absolutely not. It's clear that the TARDIS isn't the only thing that's blue around here. Aunt Vanessa is killed by the Master, and Tegan enters the TARDIS by mistake, getting lost in the maze of corridors and venting her frustration at every opportunity. Tegan Joe Vanker, and I'm not answering a question. You tell me exactly you are. While you wouldn't see much of this just yet, Tegan was created as a bossy and argumentative character. But I think by now everyone was just walking around on eggshells as Tom Baker's departure loomed. They should know better than that. There have been enough unnecessary deaths as it is. It's often been suggested that Brisbane girl Tegan was perhaps cast in order to get the Australian Broadcasting Corporation to kick in some funds. But their offer of eight cents a day was not what the BBC was looking for. Back home in Brisbane, we'd call that a sweatshop. Back to the story. The Master is causing all sorts of mischief using his trademark weapon, the Tissue Compression Eliminator, which turns people into Action Man dolls faster than a dog chasing a butcher's van. Just where the hell was he when there was a shortage of Buzz Lightyear toys in the 90s? Logopolis is a cold place. A cold, high place overlooking the universe. It holds a single great secret, my son. It turns out they are responsible for the gateway to other universes as a sort of exhaust vent, which must really suck for the people in those other universes like E-Space. Also, G-Space and T-Space. But D-Space, on the other hand, didn't seem to mind for some reason, perhaps because that universe was full of creatures all getting their news from Facebook. The Master's interference has unintentionally introduced entropy, which is destroying parts of the universe bit by bit, until the Doctor reluctantly agrees to work with the Master on a 1.1 patch for the universe. Of course, it all goes tits up as the Master reverts to type. Peoples of the universe, please attend carefully. The message that follows is vital to the future of you all. The Doctor ends up falling to his near death. He sees visions of both his enemies and his companions, while his current companions gather around. And then this happens. It's the end. But the moment has been prepared for. Well. So he was the doctor all the time. There's quite a body count among companions' relatives. Like a Thanksgiving fantasy gone wrong. Adric loses his brother. Tegan loses her aunt. I'm so sorry to you. I'm so sorry. And Nyssa loses first her stepmom, her father, her home planet, whose name escapes me, and then her entire solar system. I can't see Traken. Traken, Traken, that was it, Traken. Oh, oops, too soon. Script editor Christopher Bidmead wrote the script for Logopolis. It's a suitable send off for Tom Baker and is full of Bidmead's obsessions, attention to detail, and trying to get the science to sound, if not accurate, at least plausibly accurate. I demand to see who's ever in charge of this shit. Logopolis isn't necessarily a beloved story, with some of its obvious painted backdrops and Anthony Ainley chewing the polystyrene sets as if they were made of honey roasted ham. But it is a personal favourite of mine, from a season that isn't necessarily beloved, but again is a personal favourite of mine. Like Vegemite toast and a cup of Yorkshire tea on a cold day. The season is one that's consistent and intelligent. Materialise the TARDIS underwater and open the door or at least makes a credible attempt at appearing intelligent, like Forrest Gump wearing spectacles. That's the end of the 18th season, one of the lowest rated seasons ever. But there was just a little bit more Doctor Who for that year. Canine may have been
been written out of the series, but the blow for K9's many young fans was softened by K9 and Company. Sarah Jane Smith moves to her aunt's country home, meets her aunt's ward, Brendan, who is soon kidnapped either by witchcraft devotees or altruistic drama critics, and she finds a gift left for her by an old friend. Give Sarah Jane Smith my fondest love. Tell her I shall remember her always. Thank you, K-9. While it's great to see more K-9, and incredibly welcome to see Elizabeth Sladen again, K-9 and company suffers from, yeah, just not being very good. It's like a visit from a forensic accountant investigating your last tax return. It's overburdened by a script full of red herrings and over-explaining dialogue, and a terrible, terrible title theme over a title sequence filmed in about five minutes, which seems to feature Sarah Jane getting pie-eyed after reading the script. Although the BBC had planned it as a one-off Christmas special for broadcast in late 1981, John Nathan Turner had hoped it would be turned into a series. Decent ratings aside, that was it. One and done. The threads here would later be picked up in the Modern Who series when both Elizabeth Sladen and John Leeson appeared alongside the 10th Doctor. K9! Such was the response from fans, Sarah Jane Smith and K9 would each get their own shows in the 2000s. The Daleks only made a quick appearance this season in the Doctor's near-death flashback, but originally a much longer Dalek sequence was planned, and here we present it for the first time in its entirety. Another one bites a dust Another one bites a dust And another one gone, and another one gone Another one bites a dust Hey, gonna get you too, another one bites of dust. Tom Baker left, and the first thing he did was to work for the man who originally cast him as Doctor Who, Barry Letts, playing Sherlock Holmes in The Hound of the Baskervilles. But in general, he was not a regular face on British television for several years. Baker stayed away from Doctor Who circles for much of the 80s, even avoiding appearing in the 20th anniversary special, The Five Doctors. Despite his difficult relationship working with Lala Ward while they were dating each other, the pair surprised most people who'd worked with them by getting married in late 1980, though it was a short-lived marriage. Baker started appearing more and more in Doctor Who related events in the 90s, returning to TV roles more often, including a turn as the narrator of Little Britain. He even appeared as a retired Doctor in the 50th anniversary special. Baker again played the Doctor in Big Finish audio productions with his former companions and even patched up a few spoils relationships along the way. Tom Baker's legacy was a man who was the Doctor for seven years, but never really went away for some. To many, he always will be the Doctor. Would you like a chili, baby? So, for the incoming fifth Doctor, you know, no pressure. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.